welcome back to The Last Wish. We're on the last section. Ooh, yes. There's nothing can be done here, Mr. Neville snorted. Kept. You didn't listen to what I was saying, that's all. You never listened to me. This, I repeat, is an exceptionally strong gin. If it wasn't for that, the sorceress would have would have hold of him already. Her spell is soon going to weaken, and then the djinn is going to crush her and escape. And we'll have some peace. And in the meantime, the town will go to ruins. We've got to wait, repeated the priest, but not idly. Give out the orders, Major. Tell the people to evacuate the surrounding houses and get ready to extinguish the fire. What's happening there now is nothing compared to the hell that's going to break loose when the genie has finished with the witch. Gerald raised his head, caught Sheridan's eye, and looked away. Mr. Cripp, he suddenly decided, I need your help. It's about the portal through which Dandelion appeared here. The portal still links the town hall to... There's not even a trace of portal anywhere, the priest said coldly, pointing to the wall. Can't you see? A portal leaves a trace even when invisible. A spell can stabilize such a trace. I'll follow it. You must be mad. Even if a passage like that doesn't tear you to pieces, what do you expect to gain by it? Do you want to find yourself in the middle of a cyclone? I asked if you can cast a spell which could stabilize the trace. Spell? The priest proudly raised his head. I'm not a godless sorcerer. I don't cast spells. My power comes from faith and prayer. Can you or can't you? I can. Then get on with it, because time's pressing on, Gerald said Dandelion. You've gone stark, raving mad. Keep away from that bloody strangler. Silence, please, said Crep. And gravity, I'm praying. To hell with your prayers, Neville hollered. I'm off to gather the people. We've got to do something and not stand here ga gabbling. Gods, what a day. What a bloody day. The witcher felt Sheridan touch his shoulder. He turned. The elf looked him in the eyes, then lowered his own. You're going there because you have to, aren't you? Gerald hesitated. Hesitated. He thought he smelled the scent of lilac and gooseberries. I think so, he said reluctantly. I do have to. I'm sorry, Sheridan. Don't apologize. I know what you feel. I doubt it, because I don't know myself. Then uh, the elf smiled. The smile had little to do with joy. That's just it, Gerald, precisely. Crip pulled himself upright and took a deep breath. Ready, he said, pointing with pride at the barely visible outline on the wall. But the portal is unsteady and won't stay there for long, and there's no way to be sure it won't break. Before you step through, sir, examine your conscience. I can give you a blessing, but in order to forgive you your sins... There's no time, Gerald finished the sentence for him. I know, Mr. Crepe. There's never enough time for it. Leave the chamber, all of you. If the portal explodes, it'll burst your eardrums. I'll stay, said Crep. When the door had closed behind Dandelion and the elf, he waved his hands in the air, creating a pulsating aura around himself. I'll spread some protection just in case, and if the portal does burst, I'll try to pull you out, Witcher. What are eardrums to me? They'll grow back. Gr Gerald looked at him more kindly. The priest smiled. 
You're a brave man, he said. You want to save her, don't you? But bravery isn't going to be of much use to you. Jinns are, are vengeful beings. The sorceress is lost. And if you go there, you'll be lost too. Examine your conscience. I have. Gerald stood in front of the faintly glowing portal. Mr. Crep, sir? Yes. The exorcism which made you so angry. What do the words mean? Indeed. What a moment for quips and jokes. Please, Mr. Crep, sir. Oh, well, said the priest, hiding behind the mayor's heavy oak table. It's your last wish, so I'll tell you it means. Mm, essentially, get out of here. Go fuck yourself. Gerald <laughs> entered the nothingness, where, where cold stifled the laughter which was shaking him. All right, now we're finally on The Last Wish, Part 8. The portal, roaring and whirling like a hurricane, spat him out with a force that bruised his lungs. The witcher collapsed on the floor, panting, catching his breath with difficulty. <clears throat> the floor shook. At first he thought he was trembling after his journey through the splitting <clears throat> hell of the portal, but he rapidly realized his mistake. The whole house was vibrating, trembling creaking. He looked around. He was not in the small room where he had last seen Yennefer and Dandelion, but in the large communal hall of Erdel's renovation tavern. He saw her. She was kneeling between the tables, bent over the magical sphere. The sphere was aflame with strong milky light so bright enough to shine red through her fingers. The light from the sphere illuminated a scene, flickering and swaying but clear. Gerald saw on the small room with a, st with a star and a pentagram traced on the floor, blazing with white heat. He saw many colored, creaking, fiery lines shooting from the pentagram and disappearing up over the roof toward the furious roar of the captured djinn. Yennefer saw him, jumped up, and raised her hand. No, she he shouted. Don't do this. I want to help you. Help, he, she snored. You? Me? In spite of what I did to you? In spite of it. Interesting, but not important. I don't need your help. Get out of here. No. <clears throat> Get out of here, she yelled, grimacing ominously. It's getting dangerous. The whole thing's getting out of control. Do you understand? I can't must <coughs> master him. I don't get it. But the scoundrel isn't weakening at all. I caught him once. He'd fulfilled the Troubledore's third wish, and I should, should have him in the sphere by now. But he's not getting any weaker. Damn it. It looks as if he's getting stronger, but I'm still going to get the better of him. I'll break you won't break him, Yennefer. He'll kill you. Oh. It's it's about me time or promotion time. If you like YA, YA urban fantasy, vampires, teen romance, then check out my book, Vampire Juice. The link is in the bio. Now let's continue. Get out of here, she yelled, grimacing honestly. It's getting dangerous. The whole thing's getting out of control. Do you understand? I can't master him. I don't get it. But the scoundrel isn't weakening at all. I caught him once. He'd fulfilled the troubledore's third wish, and I should have, have him in the sphere by now. But he's not getting weaker, damn it. It looks as if he's getting stronger, but I'm still going to get the better of him. I'll break. You won't break him, Yennefer. He'll kill you. It's not easy to kill me. She broke off. The whole roof of the tavern 
suddenly flared up. The vision projected the sphere dissolved in the brightness. A huge fire rectangle appeared on the ceiling. The sorceress cursed as she lifted her hands and sparks gushed from her fingers. Run, Gerald. What's happening, Yennefer? He's locating me. She groaned, flushing red with effort. He wants to get at me. He's creating his own portal to get in. He can't break loose, but he'll get in by the portal. I can't. I can't stop him. Yennefer, don't distract me. <clears throat> I've got to concentrate. Gerald, you've got to get out of here. I'll open my portal as a way for you to escape. Be careful. It'll be a random portal. I haven't got time or strength for any other. I don't know where you'll end up, and but you'll be safe. Get ready. A huge portal on the ceiling suddenly flared blindingly, expanding, and grew deformed. Out of the nothingness appeared the shapeless mouth, already known as known to the Witcher, snapping its drooping lips, howling loudly enough to pierce his ears. Yennefer jumped, waved her arms, and shouted an incantation. A net of light shot from her palm and fell on the gin. It gave a roar and spouted, sprouted long paws, which shot toward the sorceress's throat like a attacking cobra's. Yennefer didn't back away. Gerald threw himself toward her, pushed her aside, and shielded her. The jinn tangled in the man, in the magical light, sprang from the portal like a cork from a bottle, and threw himself at them opening his jaws. The witcher clenched his teeth and hit him with a sign without any apparent effect. But the djinn didn't attack. He hung in the air just below the ceiling, swelled to an impressive size, go goggled at Gerald with his pale eyes and roared. There was something in that roar, something like a command, an order. He didn't understand what it was. This way, <coughs> shouted Yennefer, indicating the portal which she had conjured up on the wall by the stairs. In comparison to the one created by the genie, the sorceress's portal looked feeble, extremely inferior. This way, Gerald, run for it, only with you. Yennefer, sweeping the air with her hands, was shouting incantations, and the many color Fetters sh showered sparks and creaked. The djinn whirled like the bumblebee, pulling the bonds tight, then loosening them. Slowly but surely, he was drawing closer to the sorceress. Yennefer did not back away. The witcher leapt, at, leapt to her, deftly tripped her up and grabbed her by the wrist with one hand and dug the other into the hair the hair at the nape. Yennefer cursed nastily and thumped him in the neck with her elbow. He didn't let go of her. The penetrating smell of ozone created by the curses didn't kill the smell of the lilac and the gooseberries. Gerald stilled, stilled the sorceress's kicking legs and jumped, raising her, her straight up flickering the nothingness of the lesser portal, the portal which led into the unknown. They flew out <clears throat> in a tight embrace, fell onto a marble floor, slit and slid across, knocking over an enormous candlestick and a table from which crystal goblets, platters of fruit, and a huge bowl of crushed ice, seaweed, oysters, showered down with a crash. Screams and squeals came from around the room. They were lying in the center of a ballroom, bright with canabra. Richly clad gentlemen and ladies, sparkling with jewels, had stopped dancing and were watching them in stunned silence. The musicians in the gallery finished their piece, in which grated on the ears. 
You moron, Yennefer yelled, trying to scratch out his eyes. You bloody idiot. You stopped me. I nearly had him. You had shit all, he shouted back, furious. I saved your life with you stupid witch. She hissed like a furious cat. Her palms showered sparks. Gerald <coughs> turned his face away. Face away caught her by both wrists. They toiled among the oysters, seaweed, and crushed ice. Do you have an invitation? A portly man with a golden chain of a chamberlain on his chest was looking at them with a haughty expression. Screw yourself, screamed Yennefer, still trying to scratch Gerald's eyes out. It's a scandal, the chamberlain said empathetically. Verily, you're exaggerating with this teleportation. I'm going to complain to the Council of Wizards. I'll demand no one ever heard what the Chamberlain would demand. Yennefer wrenched herself free, slapped, slapped the Witcher in the ear with her open palm, kicked him forcefully in the shin, and jumped into the fading portal in the wall. Gerald threw himself after her, catching her hair and belt with a practical move. Yennefer, also having gained practice, landed him a blow with her elbow. The sudden move split her across the arm, split her dress at the armpit, revealing a shapely breast. An oyster flew from her torn dress. They both fell into the nothingness of the portal. Gerald could still hear the Chamberlain's voice. Music! Play on! Nothing has happened. Please take no notice of the pitiful incident. The Witcher was, convin was convinced that every success successive journey through the portal, the risk of misfortune was multiplying, and he wasn't mistaken. They hit the target, Edril's Tavern, but they materialized just under the ceiling. They fell, shattering the stair, the stair with a deafening crash, landed on the table. The table had the, the right not to withstand the blow, and it didn't. Yennefer found herself under the table. He was sure she had lost consciousness. He was mistaken. She punched him in the eye and fired a volley of insult straight at him, which would do credit to a dwarfen undertaker. And they were renowned for their foul language. The curses were accompanied by furious, chaotic blows dealt blindly, randomly. Gerald grabbed her by the hands, and to avoid being hit by her forehead, thrust his face into the sorceress's cleavage, which smelled of lilac, gooseberries, and oysters. Oh my god. <laughs> Let me go, she screamed, kicking like a pony. You idiot. Let go. The fetters are going to break any moment now. I've got to strengthen them, or the djinn will escape. He didn't answer, although he wanted to. He grasped her even more tightly. He, he grasped her more tightly, trying to pin her down on the floor. To the floor, Yennefer swore horribly, struggling, and with all her strength kicked him in the crotch with her knee. Before he could catch his breath, she broke free and screamed an incantation. He felt a terrible force drag him from the ground and hurl him across the hall until, with violence that near stunned him, he slammed against a carved two-door chest of drawers and shattered it completely. All right, now, for part nine of The Last Wish. Whoa. What's happening there, Dandelion, clinging to the wall? 
strained his neck, trying to see through the downpour. Tell me what's happening there, damn it. There's fighting, yelled an urchin, springing away from the tavern window, as if he'd burned himself. His tattered <clears throat> friends also escaped, slapping the mud with their bare heels. The sorcerer and the witch are fighting. Fighting? Neville was surprised. They're fighting, and that shitty demon is ruining my town. Look, he's knocked <clears throat> another chimney down and damaged the brick kiln. Hey, you get over there, quick. Gods, we're lucky it's raining or there'd be a fire like, like nobody's business. This won't last much longer, Krep said gloomily. The magical light is weakening. The bonds will break at any moment. Mr. Neville ordered the people to move back. All hell's going to break loose over there in any, at any minute. There'll be only splinters left at the house. Mr. Edel, what are you laughing at? It's your house. What makes you so moose? I had that wreck insured for a massive sum. Does the policy cover magical and supernatural events? Of course. That's wise, Mr. Elf. Very wise. Congratulations. Hey, you people, get to some shelter. Don't get any closer. If you value your lives, <clears throat> a deafening crash came from within Edril's house, and lightning flashed. The small crowd recreated hiding behind the pillars. Why did Gerald go there? groaned Dandelion. What the hell for? Why did he insist on saving the witch? Why, damn it? Children, do you understand? The elf smiled sadly. Yes, I do, Dandelion. He said, I do. All right, last wish, part nine. Ooh, I, I'm sorry, not part nine, part ten. Jaron leapt away from another blazing orange shaft, which shot from the sorceress's fingers. She was clearly clearly tired. The shafts were weak and slow, and he avoided them with no great difficulty. Yennefer, he shouted, "Calm down." Will you listen? You won't be able to. He didn't finish. Thin red bolts of lightning spurred from the sorcerer's hands, reaching him in many places and wrapping him up thoroughly. His clothes hissed and started to smolder. I won't be able to, she said, through her teeth standing over him. You'll soon see what I'm capable of. It will surface for you to lie there for a while and not get in my way. Get this off me, he roared, struggling in the blazing spider web. I'm burning, damn it. Lie there and don't move, she advised, panting heavily. It only burns when you move. I can't spare you any more time, Witcher. We had a romp, but enough is enough. I've got to take care of the gin. He's already, he's ready to run away. Run away, Gerald screamed. It's you who should run away, the gen Jennifer. Listen to me carefully. I've got to tell you the truth. The gin gave a tug at the fetters, traced a circle, tightened the lines holding it, and swept the little tower of, of Bo Barrett's house. What a roar he's got, Dandelion frowned, ins instinctively clasping his throat. What a terrible roar. It looks as if he's bloody furious. That's because he is, said Krep. Ch uh, Cheridan glanced at him. What? He's furious, repeated Krep. And I'm not surprised. I'd be furious too if I had to fulfill to the letter the first wish accidentally expressed by the witcher. How's that? shouted Dandelion. Gerald. Gerald? Wish? He's the one who held the seal which imprisoned the djinn. The djinn's fulfilling his wishes. That's why the witch can't master it. But the witcher mustn't tell her, even if he's caught on 
after he's caught on to it by now. He shouldn't tell her. Damn it, muttered children. I'm beginning to understand. The warder in the dungeon burst. That was the witcher's second wish. He still got one left, the last one. But God help us, he shouldn't reveal that to Yennefer. She stood motionless, leaning over him, paying no attention to the jinn, struggling at his bonds above the tavern roof. The building shook. Lime and splinters poured from the ceiling. Furniture crept along the floor, shuddering spasmodically. So, that's how it is, she hissed. Congratulations. You deceived me. Not Dandelion, but you. That's why the djinn's fighting so hard. But I haven't lost yet, Gerald. You, under, you underestimate me. And you underestimate my power. I still got the djinn and you in my hand. You've still got one last wish, haven't you? So make it. You'll free the djinn and then I'll bottle it. You haven't got enough strength left, Yennefer. You underestimate my strength. The wish, Gerald. No, Yennefer, I can't. The djinn might fulfill it, but it won't spare you. It'll kill you when it's free. It'll take its revenge on you. You won't manage to catch it, and you won't manage to defend yourself against it. You're weakened. You can barely stand. You'll die, Yennefer. That's my risk, she shouted, enraged. What is, what's it to you? What happens to me? Th think rather, think rather what the djinn can give you. You, you've still got one wish. You can't ask what you like. Make, what? Make use of it. Use it, Witcher. You can have anything. Anything. Are they both going to die? Wailed Dandelion. How come? Crep. Why? After all, the Witcher. Why, by all perfidious and unexpected plagues, isn't he escaping? Why? What's keeping him? Why doesn't he leave that bloody witch to her fate and run away? It's senseless. Absolutely senseless, repeated Sheridan barely. Absolute. It's suicide. And plain idiocy. It's the job, after all, interrupted Neville. The witchers saving my town. May the gods be my witness. And if he defeats the witch... And chases that demon away. I'll reward him handsomely. Dandelion snatched the hat decorated with a heron's feather from his head, spat into it, threw it in the mud, and trampled on it, spitting out words in various languages as he did. But he's, he groaned suddenly, still got one wish uh, in reserve. He could. Say both her and himself, Mr. Crep. It's not that simple, the priest pondered. But if, if he expressed the right wish, if he somehow tied his fate to the f fate to the fate, no, I don't think he would think it would occur to him. It's probably better that he, it doesn't. The wish, Gerald. Hurry up. What do you desire? Immortality, richness, fame, power, might, privileges. Hurry. We haven't any time. He was silent. Humanity, she said suddenly, smiling nastily. I've guessed, haven't I? That's what you want. That's what you dream of. Of, of release of the freedom to, to who you want, not to who you have to be. The djinn will fulfill that wish, Gerald. Just say it. He stayed silent. He st she stood over him in the flickering radiance of the wizard's fear. In the glow of magic, a mist of flashes of rays restraining the djinn, streaming hair, eyes blazing violet, 
erect, slender, dark, terrible, and beautiful. All of a sudden, she leaned over and looked at him. In, in the eyes, he caught the scent of lilac and gooseberries. You're not saying anything, she hissed. So what is it you desire, Witcher? What is your most hidden dream? Is it that you don't know or you can't decide? Look for it within yourself. Look deeply and carefully because I swear by the force you won't get another chance like this. Did you catch that? The force? That's that's a Jedi reference. But he suddenly knew the truth. He knew it. He knew what she used to be. What she remembered. What she couldn't forget. And what she lived with. Who she really was before she had become a sorceress. Her cold, penetrating, angry, and wise eyes were those of a hunchback. He was horrified. No, not of the truth. He was horrified that she would read his thoughts, find out, find out what he had guessed, that she would never forgive him for it. He deadened that thought within himself, killed it, threw it from his memory forever, without a trace, feeling as he did so, enormous relief, feeling that the ceiling the feeling that the ceiling cracked open, the gin entangled in the net of the now fading rays, tumbling right on top of them, roaring in that roar were triumph and murder lust. Yennefer leapt to meet him. Light beamed from her hands, very feeble light. The djinn opened his mouth and stretched his paws toward her. The witcher suddenly understood what it was he wanted, and he made his wish. I wonder what the wish is. The house exploded. Bricks, beams, and planks flew up in a cloud of smoke and sparks. The djinn spurted from the dust storm, as huge as a barn, roaring and choking with triumphant laughter. The air genie, free now, not tied to anyone's will, traced three circles above the town, tore the spire from the town hall, and soared into the sky and vanished. It's escaped! It's escaped! called Crep. The witcher's had his way. Genie has flown away. It won't be a threat to anyone anymore. Ah, said Edril, with genuine rapture. What a wonderful ruin. Damn it, damn it, hollered Dandelion, huddled behind the wall. It shattered the entire house. Nobody could survive that. Nobody, I tell you. The witcher, Gerald of Rivia, has sacrificed himself for the town, Mayor Neville said ceremoniously. We won't forget him. We'll revere him. We'll think of it. We'll think of a statue. Dandelion shook a piece of wicker matting bound with clay from his shoulder, brushed the jerkin free of lumps of many dampened plaster, looked at the mayor in a few well-chosen words, expressed his opinion about sacrifice, reverence, memory, and all the statues in the world. Gerald looked around. Water was slowly dripping from the hole in the ceiling. There were heaps of rubble, cracks of timber all around. By a strange coincidence, the, the place where the where they lay was completely clear. Not one plank or brick had fallen on them. It was as if they were being protected by an invisible shield. Yennefer, slightly flushed, knelt by him, resetting her hands on her knees. Witcher, she cleared her throat. Are you dead? No, 
Gerald wiped the dust from his face and hissed. Slowly, Yennefer touched his wrist and gently ran her fingers along his palm. I burnt you. It's nothing. A few blisters. I'm sorry. You know, the gin escaped for good. Do you regret it? Not much. Good. Help me up, please. Wait, she whispered. That wish of yours. I heard what you wish for. I was astounded, simply astounded. I didn't have expected anything but to... What made you do it, Gerald? Why? Why me? Don't you know? She leaned over him and touched him. He felt her hair, smelling of lilac and gooseberries, brush his face, and he suddenly knew that he had, he'd never forget that scent, the soft touch knew that he'd never be able to compare it to any other scent or touch. Yennefer kissed him, and he understood what he had never desire any lips other than hers, so soft and moist, sweet, with lipstick. He knew that from that moment only she would exist, would exist. Her neck, shoulders, breasts, freed from the black dress, her delicate, cool skin, which couldn't be compared to any other he had ever touched. He gazed into the violet eyes, the most beautiful eyes in the world, eyes which he feared would become everything he knew. Your wish, she whispered, her lips very near his ear. I didn't know whether such a wish could could, can ever be fulfilled. I don't know whether that's such a force in nature that could fulfill such a wish, but there is. Then you've condemned yourself, God. Condemned yourself to me. He interrupted her with a kiss, an embrace, a touch, a caress, and then with everything, his whole being, his every thought, his only thought, everything, everything, everything. They broke to the silence and with sighs and the rustle of clothing uh, strewn to the floor. They broke the silence very gently, lazily, and they were considerate and very thorough. They were caring and tender, and although neither quite knew what caring and tenderness were, they succeeded because they were much they very much wanted to, and they were in no hurry whatsoever. The whole world had ceased to exist for a brief moment, but to them it seemed like a whole eternity. And then the world started to exist again, but it existed very differently. Gerald, hmm, what now? I don't know. Nor do I, because you see, I don't know whether... It was worth condemning yourself to me? I don't know. How? Wait. What are you doing? I wanted to tell you. Yeah, 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 she repeated, giving him, giving in to him completely. Nobody's ever called me that. Say it again. Yen, Gerald. All right. Now we're on part 17. We've done quite a bit. All right. It had stopped raining. A rainbow appeared over Rhine and cut the sky with a broken colored arc. It looked as if it grew straight from the tavern's ruined roof. By all the gods, muttered Dandelion. What silence. They're dead, I tell you. Either they've killed each other, or my gins finished them off. We should go see, said Radomir, wiping his brow. This, we're almost done with this. Ooh. 
with his crumpled hat. They might be wounded. Should I call a doctor? An undertaker, more like it, said Crep. I know that witch, and that witch has got the devil in his eyes, too. There's no two, two ways about it. We've got to start dig digging two pits in the cemetery. I'd advise sticking an aspen stake into that Yennefer before burying her. What silence, repeated Dandelion. Beans were flying all over the place a moment ago, and now it's quiet as a grave. They approached the tavern ruins very cautiously and slowly. Let the carpenter get the coffins ready, said Crep. Tell the carpenter. Quiet, interrupted Riddle. I heard something. What is it, Chandran? The elf brushed the hair off his pointed ear and tilted his head. I'm not sure. Let's get closer. Yennefer's alive, said Dandelion suddenly, straining his musical ear. I heard her moan. There she moaned again. Ah, confirmed Idril. I heard it too. She moaned. She must really be suffering. Chandran, where are you going? Careful, the elf backed away from the shattered window through which he had carefully peeped. Let's get out of here, he said quietly. Let's not disturb them. They're both alive, Chenron. What are they doing? Let's get out of here, repeated the elf. Let's leave them alone for a bit. Let them stay there. Yennefer, Gerald, and his last wish. Let's wait in a tavern. They'll join us before long, both of them. What are you doing? Daniel Lyon was curious. Tell me, damn it. The elf smiled very, very sadly. I don't like grand words, he said, and it's impossible to give it a name without using grand words. Oh my goodness. Chapter 7 The Voice of Reason. Ooh. How many pages do we have left? Not much. We have 20 pages left. So this is the last of it. We're finishing the last wish. Fulwick, in full armor, without a helmet, and with the crimson croat of the order flung over his shoulder, stood in the glade. Next to him... With his arms crossed, his chest was a stocky, bearded dwarf in an overcoat lined with a fox fur over a chain mall shirt of iron rings. Tally's wearing no armor but a short, quilted doublet. Paced slowly, brandishing his unsheathed sword from time to time. The witcher looked about, restraining his horse. All around glinted the caresses and flat helmets of soldiers armed with lances. Bloody hell, muttered Gerald. I might have expected this. Dandelion turned his horse and quietly cursed at the sight of the lances cutting off their retreat. What's this about, Gerald? Nothing. Keep your mouth shut and don't butt in. I'll try to lie my way out of it somehow. What's it about? I ask you. More trouble? Shut up. It was a stupid idea, after all, to ride into town, groaned the troubled door, glancing toward the nearby towers of the temple, visible above the forest. We should have stayed at the neck Neeks and not stir, stir beyond the walls. Shut up. It'll all become clear. You'll see. Doesn't look like it. Dandelion was right. It didn't. Tally's brandishing his naked sword continued pacing without looking in their direction. The soldiers leaning on their spears were watching gloomily and differently with the expression of professionals for whom killing does not provoke much interest. They dismounted. 
Falwick and the dwarf slowly approached. You've insulted Tully's, a man of good birth, Witcher, said the Count without preamble or customary courtesies. And Tully's are, you no doubt remember, threw down the gauntlet. It was not fit to press you within the grounds of the temple. So we waited until you emerged from behind the priestess's skirt. Tally's is waiting. You must fight. Must? Must? But do you not think Falwick? Gerald smiled disapprovingly. That Tally's, a man of good birth, does me too much honor. I never attained the honor of being knighted. It is best not to mention the circumstances of my birth. I fear I'm not sufficiently worthy of... How does one say it, Dandelion? I'm fit to give satisfaction and joust in the lists, recited poet pouting. The Code of Chivalry proclaims... The chapter of the Order is governed by its own code, interrupted Falwick. If it were you who challenged a knight of the Order... He could either refuse or grant your satisfaction according to his will. But this is reverse. It is the knight who challenges you, and by this he raises you to his own level. But of course, only for the time it takes to revenge, avenge the insult. You can't refuse. The refusal of accept, accepting the dignity would render you unworthy. How logical, said Dandelion, with an ape-like expression. I see you studied philosophers, Sir Knight. Don't butt in. Gerald raised his head and looked him into Falwick's eyes. Go on, sir. I'd like to know where this is leading. What would happen if I turned out to be unworthy? What would happen? Falwick gave a malicious smile. I'd order you hung from a branch, you rat catcher. Hold on, the dwarf said hoarsely. Take it easy, sir. And no invented vective, all right? Don't you... Don't you teach me manners, Crammer, hissed the knight. And remember, the prince has given you orders which you're to execute to the letter. It's you who should be teaching me, Count. The dwarf rested his hand on the double-headed axe thrust into the belt. I know how to carry out orders, and I can do without your advice. Allow me, jail sir. I'm Dennis Kramer, captain of the Prince Hereward's guards. The witcher bowed stiffly, looking into the dwarf's eyes, light gray and steel-like beneath his bushy flaxen eyebrows. Stand your ground with Tally, sir. Dennis Kramer. Oh my goodness, it's... Oh, sorry about that. Dennis Kramer continued calmly. It'll be better that way. It's not a fight to the death, only until one of you rendered helpless. <laughs> so fight in the field and let him render you helpless. I beg your pardon? Sir Tallies is the prince's favorite, said Falwick, smiling spitefully. If you touch him with your saber during the fight... You, mutant, you will be punished. Captain Kramer will arrest you and take you to face his highness. To be punished. Those are his orders. The dwarf didn't even glance at the knight. His cold steel eyes did not leave Ger Gerald. The witcher smiled faintly, but quite nastily. If I understand correctly, he said, I do fight the duel, because if I refuse, I'll be hanged. If I fight, I'm, <clears throat> I'm to allow my opponent to injure me, because if I wound him, 
I'll be put to the rack. What charming alternatives. Maybe I should save you the bother. I'll thump my head against the pine tree and render myself helpless. Will that grant you satisfaction? Don't sneer, Fenwick, hissed Fenwick. Don't make your situation any worse. You've insulted the order, you vagabond, and you have to be punished for it. You understand? And young Tallies needs the fame of defeating a witcher. So the chapter wants to give it give it to him. Otherwise, you'd be hanging already. You allow yourself to be defeated and save your miserable life. We don't care about your corpse. We want Tallies to nick your skin. And you, your mutant skin heals quickly. So go ahead. Decide. You've got no choice. Ah, no choice. That's what you think, is it, sir? Gerald smiled even more nastily and looked around at the soldiers appraisingly. I think I do. Yes, that's true, admitted Dennis Craner. You do. But then there be bloodshed, great bloodshed, like at Blavikin. Is that what you want? Do you want to burden your conscience with blood and death? Because the alternative you're thinking of, Ge uh, Gerald, is blood and death. Your argument is charming, Captain. Fascinating, even, mocked Dandelion. You're trying to bait a man ambushed in the forest with humanitarianism, calling on his nobler feelings. You ask him, as I understand it, to, dis to deign not to spill the blood of brigands who attacked him. He's to take pity on the thugs because the thugs are poor, have got wives, children, and who knows, maybe even mothers. But don't you think, Captain Kramer, that your worry is premature? Because I look at your lancers and see that their knees are shaking at the at the thought at the very thought of fighting with Gerald of Rivia. The Witcher who dealt with this the Striga alone with his bare hands. There won't be any bloodshed here. Nobody will be harmed here, aside from those who might break their legs running away. I said the dwarf, I said the dwarf calmly, and I have nothing to reproach my knees with. I've never run away from anyone, and I'm not about to change my ways. I'm not married, don't know anything about my children, and I prefer not to bring my not to bring my mother, a woman with venom, with whom I'm not very well acquainted, into this. But I will carry out the orders I've been given. To the letter, as always, without calling on any feelings, I ask Gerald of Rivia to make a decision. I will accept whatever he decides and will behave accordingly. They looked at each other in the eyes, the dwarf and the witcher. Very well, Gerald said finally. Let's deal with him. It's a pity to waste the day. You agree then, Fedwick raised his head and his eyes glistened. You'll fight a duel with Hadborn Tallies of Den of Dorndal? Yes. Good. Prepare yourself. I'm ready, Gerald pulled on his pulled on his gauntlets. Let's not waste time. There there'll be hell if Nemenki finds out about this, so let's sort it out quickly. Then keep calm. Oops. 
Sorry about that. Uh, it's got nothing to do with you. Am I right, Kramer, sir? Absolutely. The dwarf seated himself firmly and looked at Frederick. Abso absolutely, sir. Whatever happens, it only concerns you. The witcher took the sword from his back. No, said Felwick, drawing his. You're not going to fight with the, the razor of yours. Take my sword. Gerald shrugged. He took the Count's blade and swiped it to try it out. Abby, he said coldly. We could just as easily use spades. Tally's has the same. Equal chances. You're, you're very funny, Falwick. The soldiers surrounded the glade, forming a loose circle. Tally's and the Witcher stood facing each other. Tally's. What do you say to an apology? The young knight screwed up his lips, folded his left arm behind his back, and froze in a fencing position. No? Gerald smiled. You don't want to listen to the voice of reason? Pity. Gerald squatted down, leapt and attacked without warning the witcher, did even make an effort to parry, and avoided the flat point with a swift half-turn. The knight swiped broadly. The blade cut through the air once more. Gerald dodged beneath it, in an agile pirouette, jumped softly aside with a short, light faint, faint through, tallies off his rhythm. Tallies cursed and broadly and cut broadly from the right. Lost his balance for a moment and tried to gain it a while, instinctively, clumsily, holding the sword high to defend himself. The witcher struck with the speed and force of light of a lightning bolt, extending his arm to its full length and slashing straight ahead, the heavy sword thundered against Tally's blade, deflected it so hard it hit the knight in the face. Tally's howl fell to his knees and touched the grass with his forehead. Falwick ran up to him. Gerald dug his sword into the ground and turned around. Hey, guards, yelled Felwick, getting up. Take him! Stand still to your places, growled Dennis Kramer, touching his axe. The sol soldiers froze. No, Count, the dwarf said slowly. I always execute orders to the letter. The witcher did not touch tallies. The kid hit himself with his own iron. It his hard luck. <laughs> oh my goodness. His face is destroyed. He's disfigured for life. Skin heals. Dennis Kramer fixed his seal eyes on the witcher and beneath his teeth. And the scar. For a night, a scar is commendable. Reminder a reason for fame and glory, with the chapter so desired for him. A knight without a scar is a prick, not a knight. Ask him, Count, you'll see what, see that he's pleased. Tallies was writhing on the ground, spitting blood, whimpering and wailing. He didn't look pleased in the least. Kramer, said Falwick, Tearing this sword from the ground. You'll be sorry for this, I swear. The dwarf turned around, slowly pulled his axe from his belt, and coughed and spit into the palm. Oh, Count Sir, he rasped. Don't prejure yourself. I can't stand prejurers. And Prince Herward has given me the knight the right to punish them. I'll turn a deaf ear to your stupid words, but don't repeat them if you please. Witcher, Falwick, puffing with rage, turned to Gerald. 
get yourself out of Ellender immediately without a moment's delay. I rarely agree with him, muttered Dennis, approaching the Witcher and re returning his word. But in this case, he's right. I'd ride out pretty quick. We'd do as you advise, Gerald slung the belt across his back. But before that, I have words for the Count following. The Knight of the White Rose blinked nervously and wiped his palms on his coat. Let's go back to your chapter's code for a minute, continued the Witcher, trying not to smile. One thing really interests me. If I, let us say, felt disgusted and insulted by your attitude in this whole affair, if I challenge you to the sword right now, what would you do? Would you consider me sufficiently worthy to cross blades with? Or would you refuse, even though you knew that by doing so, I would take you to be unworthy, even to be spat on, punched in the face, and kicked in the arse under the eyes of the foot soldiers? Count Philly was so gracious as to satisfy my curiosity. Thalwick grew pale, took a step back, and looked around. The soldiers avoided his eyes. Dennis Crayman grimaced, struck his tongue out, and sent a jet of saliva a fair distance. Even though you're not saying anything, continued Gerald, I can hear the voice of reason in your silence. Thalwick, sir? You're satisfied my curiosity. Now, I'll satisfy yours. If the Order brothers, Mother Nanique, or the Priestess in any way, or unduly intrudes upon Captain Kramer, then may you know, Count, that I'll find you. Not caring about any code, would bleed you like a pig. The knight grew even paler. Don't forget my premise, Count. Come on, Dandelion. It's time for us to leave. Take care, Dennis. Good luck, Gerald. The dwarf gave a broad smile. Take care. I'm very pleased to have met you and hope we'll meet again. The feeling's mutual. Dennis, they rode away with abstainable slowness, not looking back. They began to canter only once they were hidden by the forest. Gerald, the poet said suddenly, Surely we'd, we won't head straight south. We'll have to make a detour to avoid Ellender and that the Hereward's lands, won't we? Or do you intend to continue with this now how? No, Daniel, I don't. We'll go through the forest and then join the traitor's trail. Remember, now a word to Nenik's presence about this quarrel. Now a word. We are riding out without any delay, I hope, immediately. Part 2 Gerald leaned over and checked the required hoop of his stirrup and fitted the stirrup leather, still stiff, smelling of new skins and hard to buckle. He adjusted the saddle girth, the travel bags, the horse blanket rolled up behind the saddle, and the silver sword strapped into it. Nanique has motion, motionless next to him, her arms folded, Dandelion approached, approached, leading his way, gelding. Thank you for the hospitality, uh, venerable one, he said seriously. And don't be angry with me anymore. I know that deep down you like me. Indeed, agreed Nanik, without smiling. I, I do, you dolt, although I don't know why myself. 
Take care. So long, Debbie. So long, Gerald. Look after yourself. The witch's smile was surly. I prefer to look after others. It turns out better in the long run. From the temple, from between the columns intertwined with ivy, Iola emerged in the company of two younger pupils. She was carrying the witcher's small chest. She avoided his eyes awkwardly, and her troubled smile combined with the brush on her freckled, chubby face made a charming picture. The pupils accompanying her didn't hide their meaningful glances and barely stopped themselves from giggling. Uh, for great melet, what is something's sake, sighed Nanique. An entire parting procession. Take the chest, Gerald. I've replenished your elixirs. You've got everything that was in short supply and that medicine you know the, you know the one take it regularly for two weeks don't forget it's important i won't thanks iola the girl lowered her head and handed him the chest she so wanted to say something she had no idea what ought to be said what words ought to be used she didn't know what she'd say, even if she could. She didn't know, and yet she so much wanted to. Their hands touched blood, 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 bones, like broken white sticks, tendons like whitish cords exploding from beneath cracked skin, cut by enormous paws bristling with thorns and sharp teeth. The hideous sound of torn flesh and shouting, shameless and horrifying in its shamelessness. The shamelessness of the end, of death, blood, and shouting. Shouting, blood, shouting. Iola, Danique, with extraordinary speed, considering her girth, rushed to the girl lying on the ground, shaken by convulsions, held by her own by her down, by her shoulders, and hair. One of the people stood as if paralyzed. The other, more clear-headed, knelt on Iola's legs. Iola arched her back and opened her mouth in a soundless mute cry. Iola! Nanique shouted. Iola, speak! Speak, child, speak! The girl stiffened even more, clenched her jaws, and a thin trickle of blood ran down her cheek. Danique, growing red with effort, shouted something which the witcher didn't understand. But his med medallion tagged at his neck so hard that he was forced to bend under the pressure of its invisible weight. Iola still. Dandelion, pale as a sheet, sighed deeply. Danique raised herself to her knees and stood with effort. Take her away, she said to the pupils. There were more of them now. They had gathered, grave and silent. Take her, repeated the priestess, carefully, and don't leave her alone. I'll be there in a minute. She turned to Gerald. The witcher was standing motionless, fiddling with the reins in, in his sweaty hands. Gerald, Iola, don't say anything, Danique. I saw it too for a moment. Gerald, don't go. I've got to. Did you see? Did you see that? Yes. And not for the first time. And there's no point in looking over your shoulder. Don't go, please. I've got to, said. See to Iola. So long, Danique. The priestess slowly shook her head, sniffed, and in an abrupt move, wiped a tear away from her wrist. Farewell, she whispered, and looking him in the eye. Well, that's it. That's it. We finished The Last Wish. 
I hope you enjoyed it. And if you like urban fantasy, I have a YA book called Vampire Juice. Link is in the bio. Thanks for watching.